Is there anybody here this morning who has ever been rescued or saved? And by that I mean your life was saved. Anybody here ever been rescued or saved? Anybody here? Okay. When I was 10 years of age, I was attending our summer camp in Newfoundland. It's called Camp Woody Acres. And what Woody Acres has going for it is a pond. We call it Southwest Pond. Now understand, in Newfoundland, we could have a, a, a pond the size of Lake Ontario, and we would still call it a pond because we have the ocean. So in comparison to the ocean, everything is a pond. Well, Southwest Pond is big and it is deep. As a matter of fact, at the camp, you could literally dive from the shore because the shore goes immediately to about 15 feet deep. Well, that summer, they were teaching us how to swim, and if you had learned how to swim, they would actually give you a badge. It was a Pathfinder honor for swimming, and I wanted to earn that Pathfinder honor, but you had to demonstrate that you could swim. So on this one particular day, I decided to practice, you know, the overhead crawl. And uh, so I launched from the shore, and I thought it would be safe to just take a spin out and around the dock, around to the other side of the shore. And I did that maybe three times, and I ran out of steam the third time. Now understand, I was maybe eight feet away from the dock, but have you ever heard, you know, an inch, you miss by an inch, you miss by a mile? I may have been eight feet away, I might as well have been eight kilometers away, because I went down. And I went down, and I don't know how deep it was, but it was over my head enough that I could actually look up and, and, and see, see the water. And I pushed off the bottom of the shore, and I come up out of the water, I exploded out of the water, I'm flailing, I'm trying to get a breath of air, and I'm trying to shout out. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever been drowning... You can have all the air in your lungs and you can't get a word out, which is really strange for a preacher, but I wasn't a preacher then. But I couldn't get the words out and I went back down. And for the second time, I hit the bottom, I pushed off, I came up, and this time I'm flailing. And somebody saw me and said, oh, I think Bob's in trouble. To which my good friend, Craig Moore, said, ah, he's just fooling around. And so I go down for the third time. And I thought, this is the time I'm going to die. And that's pretty terrifying when you're 10 years of age. And I went down, and I touched the bottom, and I was coming back up. And fortunately for me, Randy Parsons, who was on the dock that day, heard what people had said, heard what Craig had said, fortunately ignored Craig, grabbed a pole, slammed it into the water. I saw that pole, I grabbed onto it, and Randy fished me out of the lake. Randy, that day, he saved my life. He rescued me. There's a story about Dr. D.J. Gordon who was walking down the road one day and as he was walking actually towards his church, he was a preacher and he was a teacher and he was headed to his office at the church one day and he was passing this young lad who had a birdcage. And in this birdcage were three just little old field sparrows. And Dr. Gordon looked at the boy and he said, Son, uh, let me stop you for a moment. Uh, What have you got in that cage? And he said, Oh, just a couple of old field sparrows. And Dr. Gordon said, well, what do you plan to do with those birds, son? And he said, well, I'm going to play with them. Dr. Gordon said, and what are you going to do after that? And the young lad said, well, I'm just going to feed them to my cat. And Dr. Gordon looked at the boy, and he looked at his cage, and he said, son, how about I give you $2 for that cage and those birds? And Dr. the boy looked at him and said, but, 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 but Dr. Gordon, I, I mean, these birds aren't worth a dime. I, I mean, really, this, this, they're not worth $2. And the doctor said, I'll give you $2 for the birds and the cage. And the little boy said, well, it's your money. So he took the money, put it in his pocket, and gave Dr. Gordon the cage. And the boy went off, happy as can be, because he had $2 in his pocket. When Dr. Gordon got to the church, he went out around back. He opened up the cage, and out flew the three birds. And Dr. Gordon swears to this day, he heard them sing, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. (laughs) 
Saved, rescued, and redeemed are three words we Christians love to use to express and to share our concepts of the cross of Christ. And what those three words have in common is that somebody has stepped into your life to protect you from danger or from harm. Somebody came into your life to preserve your life. But what separates redeemed from those two other words is that it always costs the other person to save you. Now, you've got to ask then, why in the world would somebody do that to save you? Well, it's because of the value they place on you and your life. Anybody here redeemed? We got any redeemed people of God here this morning? God stepped into your life to save you and to protect you from harm, and he did it because of the value he placed on your life. And this morning, I want to share with you three things I've learned about this word redemption, and I want to share with you why I believe everybody here today should be and would want to be redeemed by Jesus Christ. Can I share that with you today? Is that okay? Well, the first reason you want to be redeemed is this is that redemption is free for you and me. Now, here's where I get that from. It's from our scripture reading today. It's 1 Peter, it's 1 and 18, and it reads, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your forefathers. I remember reading an article in a Dallas newspaper, and it was entitled, The Mother of All Counterfeits. And what had happened was four men had walked into the Federal Reserve down in the United States, and they tried to con the Federal Reserve out of $33 million. And the con was simple. These four men claimed to be lawyers representing Saddam Hussein, and they produced forged documents, counterfeit documents, claiming that this was written by Saddam Hussein, authorizing the Federal Reserve to release $33 million to these four men. And they got caught. Do you know why they got caught? Because they couldn't spell Saddam Hussein. (laughs) The uh, attorney general called it the counter, the mother of all counterfeits. Now, here's why I'm sharing this with you. Because there's a counterfeit redemption out there today that will tell you that you can either buy or work your way into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But what we've just read here this morning from 1 Peter is this. You were not purchased with silver or gold, but with the blood of Jesus Christ. And what that tells me is you cannot buy or work your way into the kingdom. So now why is this important? Because one day, if Jesus doesn't come, you're all going to die. And some of you are thinking, boy, this escalated quickly. But you all have a date with death. If Jesus doesn't come, one day you're going to die. And the question I love to ask is this, how are you getting out of the grave? Because what you need to know is two things. And the first is this, you cannot buy your way out of the grave. One of the wealthiest men in the world is Steve Jobs. Anybody know who Steve Jobs is? He is the founder and the creator of Apple Computers. He was one of the wealthiest men in the world, and he he died. I was sad to hear that. But do you know where Steve Jobs is today? He's still in his grave. Wealthiest man in the world worth billions of dollars, and he's still in his grave because you cannot buy your way out of the grave. You need a savior for that. But not only can you not buy your way out of the grave, but you cannot work your way out of the grave either. No matter how good you are, no matter what you do, no matter how righteous you are, you cannot work your way out of the grave. Now here's where I get that from. It's Ephesians. It's 2 and 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now let me ask you, Christian, are there good works for a Christian to do? Absolutely, you were ordained, preordained, predestined to do good works. Kindness, love, caring, and compassionate are the works that you are called to do so that you may do them and then give glory to God who is in heaven. There is good works for a Christian to do, but no matter how good those works are, they will never get you out of the grave. 
How many of you have ever heard of a TV or movie actor by the name of Paul Newman? Anybody familiar with Paul Newman? Maybe you knew him for acting. Maybe you knew him for his, um, his uh, oh, what do you call those dressings, his salad dressings. Paul Newman was a great actor. He was a smart businessman, and he was a race car driver. And he, too, he died. And his friend, good friend Sally Field, said this about Paul Newman. God only made a few perfect people, and Paul Newman was one of them. Now, I didn't know Paul Newman, but this is what I do know about him. He was kind, he was generous, and all that money he made through his salad dressings, he actually gave all of the money, all the profits, to those who were in need. I could basically say, Paul Newman was a good guy, but I doubt that he was a perfect guy. But let's imagine for one moment that he was perfect. I want to imagine for one moment that all of you today obtain some special outpouring of the Holy Spirit where from now on, from this day forward, you never sin again. You live a morally perfect life. Let me ask you, is it good enough to get you out of the grave? Absolutely not. You cannot work your way out of the grave no matter how perfect you are. You need a Savior for that. And here's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Redemption is free. It is free for you and it is free for me. Through the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ, redemption is available to all who will believe and choose it. And this is why you would want to be redeemed. Because one day, we're all going to die. But I have a way out of the grave. Do you. Redemption is free. For you and for me. And that's the first reason why you would want to be redeemed. And the second reason is this. It's because it is the power of God to save. And it comes from Romans chapter 1 and 16. I love the book of Romans. I can't wait to study this with you on Wednesday nights. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I want to ask you this morning. Anybody here ever have a bad day? I want to rephrase this. I've got eight-year-olds with their hands up. I'm praying for you. Anybody here ever been baptized and you had a bad day? Really? You've been baptized and you still struggle? I was watching a TV interview one day. And it was by actually the, the person being interviewed was a famous atheist, and it may have been uh, Harris or one of those guys. I don't remember, but I remember what they said. They said, you can have a perfect life. You can have the perfect marriage, perfect spouse, perfect kids, a great job, great income, a wonderful lifestyle, and they said, everybody struggles. And based on what I heard from you here this morning, just like me, From time to time, we all struggle. I remember one occasion, I was invited to speak at a camp meeting for teens, and there had to be close to 1,000 teens that day in attendance. And you know me, I'm a little animated, and I'm passionate, and I'm up there to preach the Word of God, and everything that could go wrong that day, it went wrong. I I mean, they started with the floodlights, and they had the floodlights directly. I think they had one floodlight per eye, and I went blind. The monitors up on the stage died, and I couldn't hear myself speak. My, my sound pack kept popping off my belt, and at one point, in the most important, passionate, powerful point in my message, my headset came flying off my head. And it did it three times. Guess who I was struggling with that day? It took me... The third time to figure out, I wasn't just struggling with bad technology. I was struggling against our enemy, Satan himself. And you see, every single person here, you have an enemy. He is a roaring lion. He is seeking your destruction. He wants to separate you from Jesus Christ. And there are days he makes it his mission to make you struggle. But thank God, we have a big brother, and his name is? Jesus. And Jesus has gained the victory. Jesus gives us the victory over the world and over Satan. And at the name of Jesus, Satan runs. Because he is our older brother. I was reminded of a story. 
about a little boy named Johnny who was in school. And Johnny couldn't have been more than eight years of age. And he was out on the playground, and he had this one kid who was bugging him. And I mean, this kid kept coming at him and coming at him and coming at him. And Johnny just wanted to choke the guy, but he said, no, 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 Dad said I can't do that. So Johnny challenged the guy to a duel. Eight years of age, and he challenged him to a duel. And he said, I want you to meet me out behind the school, and we're going to have a duel. And so after school was out, Johnny met with Danny out behind the school. They had their duel. And Johnny, he went home beaten, battered, and bruised. So much so that when he got home, his dad picked him up, put him on the kitchen counter, and he began to wipe the blood away. And he said, Johnny, how in the world did this happen? And Johnny looked at him and said, well, Dad, I did exactly what you told me to do. He said, this kid was bugging me, so I challenged him to a duel. And he said, Dad, just like a gentleman, I told him he could choose any weapon he wanted. And his dad said, well, what went wrong? He says, what I didn't realize was he was going to choose his older brother. (laughs) You have an older brother. His name is Jesus Christ, and he has won for you the victory. And there's nothing the devil is going to throw at you that Jesus has not already overcome. Do you understand that Jesus has already given you the victory over Satan? It is not a struggle, it is a battle, but it has already been won. But not only have we gained the victory over the devil himself, but do you know that Jesus has also given us victory over our sins? Do you know that he has given you victory over whatever sin besets you? I get this from Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Again, I'm reminded of a story. It is about a Hindu young man who was studying at a university. And one day his professor was, gave, him a, gave him an assignment to study other world religions. And he said, I want you to go out, find a religion, study it, come back, and tell me what you've learned. So the young Hindu had actually just recently met a Seventh-day Adventist missionary. So the young man went up to our missionary friend and he said, can I ask you, why in the world would you leave your home, your family, your friends, all that wealth, all that food, all that convenience, and come to a country like mine to be a missionary. And the missionary sat him down, and he told him about a life of sin and a life of pain, and how it was that Jesus forgave him his sin, turned his life around, and literally transformed his life. So much so that he could go halfway around the world to share Jesus with others. Well, the young man, a week later, went back to his professor to hand in his report. And his professor saw something in the young man, and he said, wait a moment, Uh, tell me, did you learn anything? And the young man looked at his professor, and he said, I've learned that we Hindus and the Christians, we have a lot in common. He said, but what they have that I don't is the Savior and the forgiveness of of my sins. You see, not only is redemption free for you and me, but it is the power of God to forgive your sin and remove your sin and save you from your sin so that you no longer sin. God saves to the uttermost and you have a Savior who has not only given you victory over the devil, but victory over yourself and your sin. And here's the last reason as to why you would want redemption. Because everybody needs a Savior. Everybody needs redemption. They said over in Vietnam, they have a rat problem. And in this one particular year, the rats were just, just, the country was overrun with them. So much so, on this particular year, I believe they killed 55 million rats and they were still overrun. So the Vietnamese government actually issued a law, issued a decree forbidding restaurants to serve cats and snakes. Now, you know it's pretty bad when you can't order chicken chow meow from your favorite restaurant, okay? When you can't get a cat burger, you know times are tough. Here's where I'm going with this. 
We have an infestation. It is called sin. And everybody here today, everybody on this planet is infected with the same disease. It is called sin. And Jesus Christ has given his life to save us from our sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This tells me everybody needs a savior. There was a newspaper editor who was actually reading his own newspaper one day. And after reading the paper, he was depressed. He read bad news story after bad news story. He read about murder. He read about rape. Crime was up. There was war in the world. The economy was depressed. And this man was reading his own paper, and he asked this question, what is wrong with the world? So he actually sat down, he wrote an editorial article talking about the plight of our world, and he asked this one question, what is wrong with our world? To which that great preacher, G.K. Chesterton, wrote back, and he said, here's what's wrong with this world. I am, because I too am a sinner. You see, G.K. Chesterton understood that everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But he wasn't the only one. So did the mayor of Chicago. Anybody here ever know the name, ever heard of the name Billy Sunday? Billy Sunday used to be uh, a really good baseball player. And then he was saved by Jesus and he turned into an evangelist. And he was one of those people who brought revival to North America in the early 1900s. I mean, everywhere he went, he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ with great power. And on this one occasion, he was going to hold an evangelistic series in the city of Chicago. And he happened to know the mayor. So he wrote his friend, the mayor, and he said, "Um, if you have anybody in the city who needs prayer and salvation, would you please put them on a list and I will pray for them? So imagine Billy Sunday's surprise when he was at his hotel in Chicago. He receives this package, and inside the envelope is a note from the mayor of Chicago saying, here's everybody I want you to pray for. Here's everybody who needs the Savior. And in that package was the telephone directory for the city of Chicago because the mayor understood that everybody in his city needed a Savior because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I love this passage right here. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus, might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Jesus Christ gave his life in exchange for yours. And why would he do that? Because when he saw you, he didn't just see a sinner. He saw a child of God worth saving. I'm going to finish with one last story. There was a gem collector who was at a convention for gem collectors and stone collectors. And he was going from table to table, up and down the aisles, looking at what people had. And he was just looking for something unique, something special. And he came across this one table, and on this table, there was this blue rock. It was about the size of a potato, and quite honestly, it looked like a potato. And the little sign next to it said, well, it's $15. The gem collector picked up the stone, and it was all he could do to keep from shaking. And he goes over to the owner of the rock, and trying to still his voice, he said, "Uh, you're asking $15 for this? And the rock collector took it from the man, looked at it, handed it back to him, and said, this ugly old thing? He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you $10 for it. Give me $10 for it, and it's yours. Gets in his wallet quickly gives the man the $10, and then he literally beats a track out of the convention. It was a blue sapphire stone. 1,900 carats worth millions of dollars. Now let me ask you, how is it that you had two men, and one man, all he saw was $10, and the other, he saw the millions? 
Same rock, same ugly stone, same blue color, but one saw ten and the other saw millions. How is that? Because one understood and saw the true value of what he had in his hands. Here's where I'm going with this. When God looks at you, he doesn't see a dirty, forsaken sinner. He doesn't see your filth. He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see your corruption. What he sees is a human being made in the image of God, and he sees somebody who is worth more to him than all of heaven. Jesus left all of heaven to give his life in exchange for yours because you are worth more to him than crowns, scepters, thrones, and streets of gold. He rescued, he risked all to rescue you. And today, you saw six people commit their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? Every single one of them, because of the watery grave and the profession of faith, have a way out of the grave. Should they die, Jesus said, even if you die, if you believe in me, you will live again. They have a way out of the grave. And that way was through the baptismal waters of committing their life to Jesus Christ. Jesus will come again. He will come again for, the, again for those of us who are redeemed. Are you redeemed? Are you redeemed? Have you given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Because if you haven't, understand he is coming. And those of us who are saved are getting up out of the grave. For the trump will sound, and the dead in Christ shall what? Rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And the reason is, is because we understood that redemption is free for you and me. And we understood and we accepted that the redemption, the gospel, is God's power to save us not only from the devil, but from sin and from the grave. And here's what you all need to know. You all need to know this one thing. Everybody, everybody needs a Savior. And this morning I'm asking you, and you don't have to get up and you don't have to come forward, but I'm asking you. Is the Holy Spirit talking to you this morning? Has the Holy Spirit been talking to you and calling you to come to Jesus? Because if you come to Jesus, he will save you. He will remove your sin. He will forgive your sin. And one day he will deliver you from the grave. And I know there's somebody here today. And God has been calling you and talking to you and asking you to come and be saved. And all you have to do is confess your need of Jesus Christ, repent of your sin, and then follow Jesus into the baptismal waters and commit your life to a love relationship, a forever love relationship with Jesus Christ. And the best part is, you don't have to pay for it and you don't have to work for it because redemption is free. For you and me. And if you want to learn more about that, then please see me after this worship service. And I would love to tell you how you can follow Jesus for the rest of your life and receive the redemption. Everybody needs a Savior. Amen.